Let me turn it over to Juan Pablo Cafello, who is a longtime friend of the Council, as well as a friend to Latin America and the arena of entrepreneurship. He's a shareholder with Greenberg Torig and also co-founder and director of IDEAME. When I hear that introduction, I always think they must be introducing my father. Um, so yeah, this is our, our second year. I'd like to um, thank Nancy and the council and Madeline for you know, their, their confidence um, in, in me and in the, the Lab Miami um, to allow us to, uh, to host the event today. Um, before we get actually talking about the program, I just wanted to point something else that I'd like to also thank the council for, that for me, um, Today's event is really a sort of model of the way these kinds of events should happen in Miami. Um, the council was uh, very, very open um, to uh, work together with the lab to put together this event, this, this space. Uh, the Knight Foundation um, is a sponsor of the space, and the Knight Foundation uh, made resources available um, to support this event. Um, one of our speakers here is from the Young Presidents Association and YPO. Um, publicized the event to their whole membership. Um, Duke University was kind enough to, um, to send down um, one of their you know, distinguished professors in the space um, to participate. The Duke communities come out in force um, to support the event. And you know, from my perspective, seeing the way the ecosystem in Miami is growing, I really feel that you know, the way it continues to grow and continues to flourish is events like this where um, you know, institutions work very, very collaboratively um, to, to make an event like this happen and, and be successful. So the, fa the fact there's actually people still standing in the back, um, you know, sort of speaks to, you know, how successful an event like this can be in Miami. I don't think a lot of people think that on a Wednesday night um, in Wynwood, you're going to get 100 people plus to talk about impact investing. Um, and so I like the fact that we're sort of playing against, against type. Um, so with that a little bit long-winded introduction, I'd like to sort of introduce um, our, our panelists. The, at the end there, we have a, a young a Jack Kennedy, um, <laughs> Nacho Gonzalez. Um, he's uh, really an amazing, an amazing person for the people who don't know him. Um, his day job is he runs, uh, he was a founder of Social Lab, um, which is an enterprise um, working in, I think, four countries at this point in Latin America. Um, helping to incubate and launch double bottom line ventures to address um, bottom of the pyramid and poverty um, in Latin America. It's really inspirational. Um, Nacho, before he, he took this charge, um, ran Un Techo Pa Mi Paises operations in the United States, um, was wildly successful, um, and showing what a renaissance guy he is. About a year ago when he left that, the last we had spoken, he was um, going to become a uh, study guitar and I just imagined him, I don't know, uh, selling uh, drinks uh, with a beautiful sunset, playing guitar the rest of his life. And I turn around and the guy's back, um, you know, addressing the most uh, difficult problems in Latin America in an incredibly innovative um, way. So we're, we're very, very lucky to, uh, to have Nacho um, with us today. So, you know, Jocelyn is a uh, you know, sim similar visionary, originally from, from Chile. So. I don't know, any Chileans want to cheer? Um, no? Okay. Um, uh, I'll cheer since I'm originally from Chile. Um, Jocelyn um, runs Minerva Capital Group. Um, they're a private equity and venture capital group based here in Miami, but focuses primarily on double bottom line ventures and impact investing um, in Latin America. Um, for me, um, when I met Jocelyn, she was in a different role, a more traditional corporate role. And um, again, talking about the ecosystem here in Miami, it really you know, inspires me a lot that people with an interest in impact investing, et cetera, can you know, sort of carve out a niche and find something to do. Um, very exciting here in Miami. Um, similarly, we have uh, Ben Wirtz, um, who's a director of business consulting at the Knight Foundation, and he runs the Knight's Enterprise Fund, which is a fund that um, invest in sometimes in double bottom line ventures, uh, sometimes not, always in ventures that have an impact on the, engaging the local community one way or another. I think you guys have about a $10 million um, or so allocation um, with that. 
Ben's one of my favorite people in part because he writes blogs like one I found on the internet that, that starts off hockey fans like donuts. So if anyone you know, wants to know what that means, you need to look for him after this panel and, and try to see how, that, how hockey fans liking donuts ties into uh, entrepreneurship and even more so in terms of uh, impact uh, investing. Um, and then we have Ka Catherine Clark, who's the director of CASE, which is a sort of center for the advancement of social entrepreneurship. I almost got it. At, at Duke University, she's an adjunct professor at the Fuqua School of Business. Um, I went to Duke, so I sort of uh, drafted her to come oh. down here, and we're very, very happy um, to, to, to have her you know, so, sort of uh, join the discussion. As, as you heard um, from Nancy, this is the second year that we do this panel. Um, last year, we really focused on um, sort of a big overview, I think, for the, for the ecosystem and the, the people in the audience in terms of what impact investing was, what social entrepreneurship is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where we're going to start, we're going to try to have this year's discussion be very, very specific and hopefully that each of you in the room, whether you're a potential investor in the space or an, or an, or an entrepreneur in the space, can leave with real specific takeaways. But before we get to that, I wanted to start by asking Catherine maybe to give a five minute cliff note sort of summary or Wikipedia summary of the impact space, et cetera. So we're all sort of on the same page when we dive into the substance. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. So the first question I'm asked is, what is impact investing anyway? And it's a very simple definition. It means investing with the intent of having two things happen. One is you get a financial return. Anything above zero counts. Um, and the second is that you have some sort of positive social or, in, or environmental impact out of your investment. Okay. So those two intentions are great. The, the actually reaping them both back at the same time um, is a little trickier. The second thing people ask me is, is this new? Um, and the answer is actually not at all. The term is new. The term was invented uh, by a bunch of people in Italy that the Rockefeller Foundation got together about five years ago who said, you know, this sustainability stuff and this double bottom line stuff has all this baggage. Everyone kind of thinks it means lower than market return. Can we come up with a new term um, that doesn't have that baggage? And they invented impact investing. But the practice of investing for these two, two goals um, has been in play for at least 30 to 50 years, if you think about microfinance and the impulse of trying to loan money and have people both pay it back and um, be able to sustain themselves, um, or if you think in the U.S. about community development and the kinds of policies that the U.S. government has put in place to encourage banks to work in and, and support communities, um, not new at all. So what's new in the past five years or so, as this kind of new umbrella term has, de has developed, is, is the engagement of many more institutions. Um, in thinking about how they might participate um, and reap benefit from this. So, you know, just to give you kind of a, a again, the, the Wikipedia view, there are private foundations driving this field, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, Omidyar Network, Kellogg, 
Um, Rockefeller, for example, pumped $50 million to build this field of impact investing over the past five years. There are private banks. Almost all of the major private banks in the U.S. have impact investing divisions. They all call them something different. Um, but uh, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, um, and global banks, Deutsche Bank and others. Um, development agencies are extremely active in this marketplace. Um, USAID, DFID, which is the U.K. development bank, um, and others. And then there is a um, growth and emergence, and we're going to talk about that more on the panel, of private funds and institutions um, raising capital specifically for these purposes. Um, on the other side of the equation, what do these guys invest in? <laughs> they invest in what we're calling impact enterprises, again, to get rid of the word social uh, some, some of the time. Uh, if you're trying to get money back out, um, it tends to be in for-profit companies, although you can give loans to nonprofits. And there are literally tens of thousands of impact enterprises. If you count microfinance, the numbers go way up. Um, most of the enterprises that have been invested in in the past, I would say, are in microfinance and affordable housing around the globe. But you can see it in every sector energy, education, housing, um, agriculture, anything you can name, there is someone saying, how do we kind of dial up the impact uh, on this investment and try to actually measure um, some kind of impact that's important to us. So that's what differentiates that. According to, so here's some numbers, according to the GIN, which is the Global Impact Investing Network, um, which is a new membership group, um, they did a survey that they released in January and said there is a total commitment, there was a total commitment of $8 billion in impact investing in 2012, and they, the, those same funds predict that they will have $9 billion in 2013, which is actually a very large percentage of growth from year to year. Um, so, it, you know, we're kind of in the middle of a territory that is exploding. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is we're also in the middle of a territory, as, as um, Steve Case uh, told me a few months ago, it just seems squishy. <laughs> and I agree with him. It does seem squishy. Why does it seem, seem squishy? It seems squishy because we don't have reliable um, performance data to give investors confidence about this kind of investment will give me this kind of return. Um, and so we're kind of in this really interesting Wild West period where a lot of people think this is important. Huge amounts of government um, subsidy and leverage are being put into the field. Um, and we have to kind of see where it all shakes out, which I hope we're going to talk about further on the panel. Well, you get uh, Mike. So I had a question for, for Jocelyn. Um, I noticed that you in uh, Lavkin, the Latin American Venture Capital Association, you wrote a, uh, a blog or a piece <coughs> sort of talking about impact investing as the next big thing, next big trend in Latin America. And you wrote that last year. I mean, how do we you know, avoid impact investing being, I don't know, the way Brazil was for years, where it was the next big thing, but for 20 years it was going to be the next big thing. How I, does I, I think, you know, just addressing that a little bit, the, the challenge of it gaining momentum is the actual allocation dollars to it. You know, I know it's, you know, there was a number that was thrown out, which is $8 billion. That, that $8 billion is how much has been allocated globally. In LATAM, last year alone, there was 7.9 billion, and this was actually published today in the New York Times by LAFCA. There was 7.9 billion dollars that was allocated to the private equity space, but there was only 100 million that was allocated to the, to the impact space, and that was allocated amongst five managers. So if you look at whether it's gaining momentum, yes, it is. But the question is, how is that allocation dollars being allocated? That's the problem. So when you have investors that are coming into the space and they're asking themselves, do I go direct or do I go through a fund manager? Okay, if I go through a fund manager, how can I ascertain the risk that I'm taking on? Because the problem is when you do an asset allocation and you take that $7.9 billion that's being allocated, sound it seems like it goes off and on but that 7.9 billion at least those managers have some level of expectation what they're saying is I'm gonna put 7.9 billion in large cap in small cap space in growth stage companies so with a li with a certain level of, of certainty they understand how much risk they're putting on the table the problem with this space 
is that there is not enough information when it comes to risk metrics, which is really the driver behind this, for them to be able to say, okay, you Minerva, or you, you know, the five other or six other funds that are out there, if we're gonna invest in that space, what is the probabilities of returns? I know that we're getting the social component, and there's Iris and there's Gin, which is the one that's gonna define if we're doing well on that side, but how are we gonna do on the financial component? See, I always, you know, related to going back to my derivatives days, which is, you know, the creative component. What, what is it that started derivatives? Derivatives basically was a note, a fixed income note, plus an option. The fixed income note would, at some point, three years or five years down the road, it would end, and you would know how much principal you're gonna get back to your note. Right? And the call option would be an option to say, okay, I'm going to participate in something that is unknown. This space is something similar. If you're a fund manager, you need to be able to provide that information to the investors, which means what portion of the risk that I am taking can I ascertain? How much do I know I'm gonna get back if I'm investing in the VC space? if I'm investing in a growth stage company, if I'm investing in a more developed company, and what's the probability of that, plus the social component. Okay, and for Ben or for Nacho, um, if, you know, for the people here in the room who, you know, I look out and I, I know there's a number of, uh, you know, active angel investors, um, non-institutional investors, but if they want to get into this space, um, do, do they, can they invest directly? Is it, are they, you know, well advised to invest through a, a, an impact fund like Minerva, be a limited partner? Totally. I mean, I'm uh, sure, uh, you know, I'm sure there's. Uh, 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 yeah, donate your money to the Knight Foundation, we'll invest it for yeah. you. No, I, I think, uh, I'll, I'll jump in and then. Uh, um, so just, I, I think I have a kind of a more nuanced view of what impact investing is, which is that, you know, impact investing is really, um, when you're, you're making an investment, and you're taking an extra d degree of risk because you want a social return, right? So if I invest in alternative energy, for example, um, and, um, and I'm happy that you know, alternative energy is gonna help uh, lower the carbon footprint, but really I'm, I'm in it to make money, that's not really uh, uh, you know, impact investing because I'm taking, you know, I, I, I just take a market return, you know, I look for, you know, I kind of evaluate risk and return the way I would any other investment, and it happens that I'm focusing on this space because I like the space, but there's nothing really, there's no additional risk that I'm willing to take, right? And so, so I think the first question when you say, when, to ask if you want to get in the game is, is are you willing to really take additional risks to get a social return, right? So identify, and if you are, then what kind of social return is going to make you willing to take that additional risk, right? So, so make sure that you, you have a mission and that, that, you know, kind of the, your investment thesis. Jump in, I love it when that, people, that, you don't, don't raise your hand. I'll raise my object. hand, I'm trying object. to be a polite student here. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I, I think your view is, is a philanthropist view. Uh -huh. I don't think everybody in the sector is willing to say, every, it's not an impact investic, investment unless it is managing extra risk, risk and possibly giving a concessionary return. Yeah, yeah, jump R in. Right, right, well, but then you're just investing. I mean, then you're investing in a space that you like, right? So, so I, I guess in, in that sense, then my advice, you know, the question was how do you jump in? Then you would just evaluate it the way you would any other in, investment and look for the look difference for is how you account for the for the bit for the impact. And if you are, you know, have an, a heightened sense of accountability and that you are you are regularly accounting for that. But, but how like for the people here yeah. in the audience, yeah. how, how should they account? What should they look for? Well, can I jump yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, jump in. Oh, this is awesome. The, the thing is this all has to be sustainable, right? Because if it's philanthropy dollars that we're all going for, then at the end of the day, it's just gonna be philanthropy dollars that are gonna sustain it. And what we really wanna do is open the space so that it is beyond the philanthropy dollars. You want also the for-profit dollars to fall into the space. And the only way to do that is to be able to speak the same language. And, and, and the way you do that is by saying, here, investor, here is the risk you're taking. This is the sector. This is the size of the companies that we're gonna invest in. And yet, here are the social components that the investment team is gonna add on to these investments. And that's so the new Nacho part of question. it. So Nacho, you guys at, at Social Lab, you've launched how many businesses? We supported uh, 111 businesses. 111 businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And when you analyze those businesses, are you you're, you're obviously cognizant of the social impact? Sure, we work with them both in the business strategy and the social impact strategy. 
and we incubate them in a space similar to this during nine months. Uh, I think that this philanthropy dollars that, that you're mentioning, they are needed to create the, this impact investing space. So this is, there is going to, to pass, we have a period where uh, while we create this uh, impact investing uh, space, we need to have philanthropy going at the same time of business. So we have to not to think whether we make philanthropy or we make business. We have to think how we can, in the middle of the time we create both uh, scenarios, we can work together. But, but so for the people in the room, and I you know, want to be specific rather than you know, philosophical here, for the people in the room, you know, if maybe you can give an example of the kind of company that they might want to invest in mm -hmm. if they're, you know, maybe willing, well, I don't know, if, if I'm not clear yet if they have to take a lower return or not, but a company that you guys are incubating that people in the room could potentially be interested in. Yeah. People are, are learning that philanthropy has different, uh, it's, it's evolving, it's changing, and people really want to, to discover new uh, opportunities of becoming engaged with social, uh, in social impact. And business can be a way of generating social impact. So a lot of, lot of investors, we have companies, governments, really want to, uh, I would say, sometimes experiment, sometimes they have more, they are more sure that, that they are going to, to have a, a return. Uh, and, 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 and as uh, you were saying, uh, some of them are moved because they are interested in, in, the, in the link between technology and poverty. Others are interested in environment. Uh, so there, there are a lot of things going on in the region, and, and I think there are a lot of opportunities. And institutions like Ashoka, like Social Lab, like Techo are um, places where investors can uh, sit down with and start the conversations to how we can create together this impact investing scenario. Well, what about, I mean, so a, a more traditional earlier stage investor in Latin America, like Casec Ventures or e -point, um, uh, Red Point E Ventures, which is a $150 million fund, or Sequoia has a fund in Latin America. I mean, are they potential investors for companies that you guys are incubating of out of that 100 and something? Or could they co-invest with Minerva I on, a, I, I on, on an investment? Or, or really, it's a different world and there's still a big divide? I think given the stage of where this space is at, um, creating that ecosystem where you have people co-investing um, and you have both you know, government and, and for-profit working together in these projects is, is certainly the way to go um, when you're investing in these different opportunities. So to answer your question, they should invest directly, of course, if they find you know, areas that are in their expertise. But I think co-investing is something that could definitely help at least the eco environment and the ecosystem of, of, of this space in particular. Yeah, because Ben, you guys, I mean, I, I heard what you said about being willing to accept a less return that, mm. you know, sometimes in Spanish we say una inversión noble, right. you know, like right. a noble investment. Right. But, but you guys co-invest, I mean, I know some people who put their money side by right, side, right, you right. guys, and they don't think that they're right. doing it for right. a social good. They no, think they're true. doing it because it's a great investment. Right. Which, um, and which, do, you guys, do you guys say no? It, no, it's also, it's also, <laughs> no, we don't, I mean, look, so, so uh, without getting too much in the details, Knight has a portfolio of about uh, 35 companies that we've invested in, um, some of which we've invested alongside venture capitalists uh, uh, on the, the same terms, and some of which where um, traditionally we're usually one of the, the only investor, if not uh, one of a few investors, and in those we take below market returns. And the, the key distinction in our mind is, is um, whether those companies are able to raise money um, in the private markets or not. Um, you know, and, and, pri and we have the luxury of, of working in the US where, where you know, there is actually a really vibrant um, uh, early stage uh, venture community um, and you can, you can readily test whether or not, not um, your company is venture back by the time we invest. And so, so, um, so, so uh, the way we look at an investment, we always have a mission lens, but, but um, the degree of return we look for depends on whether or not the market is ready to invest or not. I just wanted to add something. The, the other way to think about this is not, you know, what is the slug of capital and what return are they going to get? It's also what, you're, what we're seeing uh, more and more experimentation is realizing that you can stack capital and you can get deals done 
with different levels of interest. So a philanthropic funder might come in and say, I'm going to take the first loss um, you know, to a certain percentage. And then someone else will come in and say, well, I'll get a 2% uh, return on this. And then someone else will come in at a market rate. That market rate person would not have come into that deal unless those other people were there. But this is happening more and more as people realize we have different interests in the same deal, and we can make all of our needs and, and, and in terms of for the investors here, I saw that at Duke they have a, a social impact accelerator. Yeah, we just um, we just uh, got a ten million dollar uh, grant with USAID um, to uh, ex to to work with global health ventures around the world um, that are not early stage, but that are a little bit farther along. Um, and we're working with um, some partners at Duke Medicine and some people at McKinsey and the World Economic Forum to um, help build those business models and connect those ventures that are ready for it with the right kind of capital. The other thing I wanted to say, you keep kind of saying, well, you know, is this investable, is it not? It, you know, by, by, the, by the mainstream, the mainstream investors are only looking for either high growth if it's equity or stable low risk if it's debt. There's a whole lot of other stuff in between. Um, and that's what a lot of new impact investors are stepping in to say, you know, there are other profiles that we might actually want to invest in because of their impact that don't necessarily fit into those two camps. But say Nacho or, or you know, people who are familiar with, the, with these social accelerators, I mean, I guess if I'm an investor in the room, a nice way to go source potentially 120 companies I could invest into is yes. to go to the space that uh, Nacho has in, plug it, where, where is it? In Chile, Buenos Aires, in Colombia. Chile, Buenos Aires, in Colombia. And it's a really important way to lower risk, right? I mean, I think the, the choice for an individual investor, whether to go direct or invest in a fund, is what level of risk are you willing to maintain and what level of engagement do you want to have? I'm chair of the board of a, angel, a national angel uh, impact network in the US called uh, Investor Circle. Those investors could put their money in funds, but they really like working with the entrepreneurs. And so they choose entrepreneurs um, um, you know, who are working in areas that they care about and then, you know, work directly with them. Um, the, the other thing that we're seeing, we've been doing a study of impact investment funds around the globe who are achieving exceptional returns, which we define as meeting your goals at whatever level those are in terms of performance, um, social and financial performance. Um, and what we're seeing is that almost all of those funds are doing um, ancillary activities that are normally the realm of philanthropy. You know, they're partnering with accelerators, or they're building up, um, you know, internal right. functions, building, like, some funders have, their, have HR departments inside their funds to help, you know, match the entrepreneurs with the talent they need. This, it takes a village to get these things off the ground, and everybody's kind of And at Minerva, in. say your LPs, I mean, do you have um, investors, limited partners in your fund who, who were more traditional capital as well as, you know, sort of patient capital? What's, what's the I mean, it's, it's definitely the traditional capital. What has turned out for us a lot, too, is that most of the owners of the companies that we invest in, they themselves also end up through us investing later on as an LP because it's a, a diversification for them. So, for example, we're, we are mainly in, in, in the food and energy space. Um, and, you know, if we have a company that is in, in the agricultural business and first and they see because we're working with them, you know, and another thing too that I, I should mention as a side note, you know, when you look at funds, make sure that you look at who are the people in those funds. Um, you know, the majority of the people in our group are operators. They're people that have run companies before. If anything, I think the minority are the people that are on, on the finance side because what you need are the people that know how to manage these companies. When they're, you know, having growth concerns and when they're having challenges, you want to have someone on the team that has been a CEO of a company and that understands what are those challenges in Latin America, in a specific country. Um, and so what happens is, as you make these companies grow, and obviously it's a seven to 10 year in investment in time, and every, those same owners end up also becoming a resource to us. If we're going in a, spa in a space with a product or service where they have a specialty, that's a phone call away. Um, and they also, in the long term, end up becoming investors. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would say, there, there, I mean, there are literally four things, right? If you, if you want to do this directly and you don't want to go through a fund, I'd say there are four things. One is define the mission, you know, that you really, that you want to have impact around. Two is 
um, really understand the problem you're trying to solve, right? So, so most missions are around you know, some kind of societal problem, and you have to understand that not just on the level of this is a societal problem like you know, uh, global warming, but also on the consumer level, um, what is it that actual individuals view as a problem? Uh, the third is, is around managing risk, so establishing a structure for risk that you guys are comfortable, that, that you're comfortable with, that you really understand that helps to mitigate um, uh, um, so, uh, the, the risk of any investment. So for example, Knight only puts 10% um, of any round that we participate in, right? So what that means is, you know, other investors who come alongside um, uh, take, take a, a lot of the risk. We're diversifying our portfolio, and also we can do due, due diligence on the track record of the investors who are putting the bulk of the funds, right? So, so have a really, you know, kind of um, uh, structured uh, risk strategy in place. And then um, the last is, is you really have to be able to, or, uh, two other things. One is you really have to be able to add value, right? So if you're, if you're an impact investor and you, you really want to do it directly um, and you're not adding any value, then go to a fund, right? Really, go, that, 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 you should, you should, that, should, that should be a, a total red flag that actually you're not ready to be making these investments directly. If, if, you're, you, know, if you want to solve climate change, but you don't know the first thing about, about it, um, you, know, you really should, should start with a fund and then maybe over time you'll build up the expertise and the relationships to be able to, to, to invest directly. And then the last thing is, is measure, right? Um, if you're really serious about being an, an, an impact investor, you have to measure both the returns that you're generating um, and also the social impact that you're having, right? And, and the, the, the systems that, that Kathy mentioned at the, um, at the start help, but you, what you'll find if you do this for any length of time is if you've talked to one social investor, you've actually only gotten one set of measurements, right? Every, almost every social investor, even though there are these standards, um, it's really hard for social investors to agree on what impact is and how to measure it. And so, so you really need to be clear, at least in your own mind, because as you come into contact with other co-investors, if you don't have that clear, then you're, you're, you're totally host. Anyway, sorry. So and that and I think that also the, um, the language that social entrepreneurs are talking are very different from the, the language that VC are talking. So we have, there is a lot of leadership required to, um, to put these this, uh, two extremes together in the same table and, and trying to, to find ways on how they can work together. Uh, there are a lot of social entrepreneurs that are having a great impact, but if, if they can't escalate their project, there, there's nothing going to happen. Uh, and the same the other way around. So I think that public policy is very important in that way. And I, I, there are countries like Colombia, for example, that are investing a lot in this. Uh, Chile is also doing very well in, in, in identifying hybrid models on, on venture capital, but, it, but with social impact. Yeah, that's actually a perfect um, segue. Uh, we've been talking, I think, in this first half about um, the impact space sort of from the investor's perspective. And I think now what we want to do is, I know there's a lot of um, entrepreneurs in the room, talk about it sort of from the entrepreneur's perspective. Also, if anyone who's standing in the back wants to, now that we're segueing to the second part, Peter, Gunt, or anyone, if you want to come here and sit, please. It's the same don't price. Don't be shy. You know, it's a we won't limited do anything, time offer. Worry. Grab a seat. You don't have to stand in the back. We're not going to do Peter anything. Kellner from Endeavor. We'll hear from him in a sec. Um, so anyway, uh, for the entrepreneurs here, um, I'm actually a co-founder of IdeaMe, which is a company that um, does crowdfunding in Latin America as a way to help um, micro-entrepreneurs um, raise you know, their, their initial thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars of, of capital. There's a real focus um, in terms of, of creative project. We've helped almost 200 entrepreneurs raise over a million dollars. It was interesting because we quite honestly, when we started, we had no knowledge, sense of, of the impact space. Um, and we, we, we were almost accidental um, social impact entrepreneurs. I have to say we were a little disappointed because when we realized that you know we were in that space, we thought there'd be all this free money, all this soft dollars, money would just start you know from governments and multinational. Like everyone would just be knocking on our door, like it's so awesome what you're doing. Um, how can we help? Um, and and that di that didn't happen. I mean, we've gotten great support from some institutions, but um, I think you know based on our results, then you know then just based on our on, our, um, on our, our, the social impact that we wanted to have. So, you know, what, what are sort of the lessons or the, the, the things that entrepreneurs, and there's many here in this room, should keep in mind as they think about 
perhaps you know, launching an enterprise that's going to have a double bottom line or a social impact. I don't know, Nacho? Yeah. Um, I think the, the first thing will be to solve a real problem. Uh, entrepreneurs, and I consider myself as an entrepreneur, we, we fall in love with our ideas. And, and we really believe that what the thing we have discovered is the first, uh, the very best solution for all the problems. And, and that's not true. Uh, and, and we have to, to be honest and to be humble and to really to listen to the people we are trying to solve, to, to, to serve, and, and to include them in the, somehow in, in the process we are, we are creating. Uh, I think that's the first, the first thing I would say to, to, to have in mind. Secondly, uh, uh, one of the lessons we have, we have learned is that we really have to use the tools that we have right now, especially technology and especially internet. Uh, we started uh, doing some things uh, in universities, working together with different centers of innovations in an anal analogical way. And then we decided to change all the structure to, to, to create an open innovation web. Uh, and we realized that the opportunities that the internet gives us uh, is tremendous. So we really have to, to, to use technology and for the first time ever, we can reach people that, that used not to be reachable. So, to solve a real problem and to invest a lot in technology, I think it's one of the... And Catherine, best. what do you tell your uh, social entrepreneur, fledgling entrepreneurs? Fledgling entrepreneurs. I have two pieces of advice for fledgling entrepreneurs. One is um, figure out how aligned your social value creation is with your business model. And it's actually not easy to figure that out. Yeah, what does um, that mean? What does it mean? It means when you sell and you get a dollar for your company, are you getting an equivalent value of social mission automatically? Or do you have to do something extra to build it in? It depends on your model. Right? It's not like a, there's no formula for this. Can you, can you can give, give you an example. Yeah, so exactly. an aligned model would be somebody selling um, solar panels and saying this is alternative energy, it's gonna replace um, traditional energy sources. Every time I sell a panel, I'm having impact. I don't actually have to do anything different as a part of my operations to have that impact. A, a, a misaligned model or a, a less aligned model would be somebody who says, my mission is to hire hard to employ workers. I'm going to make sure that 75% of my workforce, like Grayston Bakery does in Yonkers, is going to be made up of these people. I need to train them. I need to find them. I need to help them get jobs afterwards. There's a whole suite of things that I need to do if I'm going to really pay attention to that community that somebody else in my line of business in, some, in, in the same industry may not have to pay for. So my first thing is, how aligned is your business in terms of it, the, the mission? What is it costing you? And then my um, advice on that is, if you have, have a business where you do not have high alignment, um, you should realize that, and you should probably try to certify yourself um, uh, or incorporate as one of these new corporate forms. So we have these things called B corporations here in the US, and um, um, those are companies that have decided to certify themselves on, based on their impact, and we have a new corporate form in the US called Benefit Corps. Um, that is actually spreading, as it spreads around the globe, work? I mean, just as a dumb question. Yeah, no, I know. Right? I have the yeah, same question. Yeah. Does, does that, I mean, does, does that actually help when you get so, to So here's the thing. We're about to release a report that we just did, a survey of um, hundreds of, of U.S.-based for-profit social entrepreneurs. The ones who are certified B corporations have grown faster, have more profits, have more employees. Um, they attract more investment? Yeah. All of their, they, are, they, are, they are off the charts on every metric of financial um, success that you'd like. And of course, so they the have the impact. Is the takeaway is B Corp, is yeah, yeah, B -corp yeah. especially if you're misaligned, especially if you have a less aligned business model. And I won't go into the detail on that. The second thing is how fast can you grow? Be really clear about whether you are ever going to be attractive to an angel or equity investor or whether, and what will it take to get that kind of growth? That like hockey stick growth, right? That the individual, right. that, the, that an equity investor or a VC firm needs. If you cannot do that or do not want to do that with your business, you need to look for alternative um, aligned capital that is mm. gonna be more patient and that's gonna work with you as you grow at a different pace. Yeah. And Jocelyn, Ben, I mean, what, it, what could be that alternative aligned capital we just heard about? Well, I would, I would say that, you know, once, once the entrepreneur gets to a certain point where they're having that momentum, you know, be very clear as to what is making your business model. Look at your numbers. What, are, what is making your margins? 
um, because if it's government subsidies or, or something along those lines, I mean, look at the, the solar power you know, market in Spain and in Germany. I mean, it almost collapsed in Spain because the government went down, and so there you go. You know, that entire industry um, just fell to its knees. So, you know, we get a lot of companies sometimes that are saying, okay, you know, we've got a business that's got 40%, 50% margins, great. But how much of that is government subsidized? And you have to understand that that's an additional layer of risk that you're adding on to the business. What is profitable today, if you take that subsidy out of the business model, does it still work? Is it still sustainable? And if the answer is yes, then you can you know, last another seven to 10 years. But if the answer is no, then you have to go back and revisit your numbers and make sure that your numbers are sustainable. But will an investor like you all, or maybe the Knight Foundation, I mean, will, would that still be attractive or? If, if we run the numbers in our case and it's still profitable, then it's a start. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, so I, I guess uh, I, I would say that the, the, just to, the one piece of advice I would give is, is just to, to be really conscious around um, how cheap it's become to create uh, an actual viable product, particularly for folks who are focused on tech, right? So it's roughly 200 times cheaper now to build a software company than it was during the dot-com boom, right? What, what, what that means for me as an investor is that I want to see you have built something before you come to me, right? I mean, you have to have something. You, you can basically prototype something for 5K if you have the technical skills. Um, to do that, and even if it's you know a super involved technical project, maybe fifty thousand dollars, right? So that means that that unless I'm an investor who's investing in that five to fifty k space, I want I want you to see I want to see you guys have something that shows me that you're solving that problem. To go back to your you know, uh, point earlier, before you come talk to me, and if you haven't done that yet, then it makes it very hard for me to invest unless you've done it before, right? The only people who can raise large amounts of money for folks, for, for ideas that haven't yet been proven are people who've done it in the past. So you need a prototype, do you need you, some customers? Do you um, have to be showing some impact? You no, know, I mean, so the more tech it is, the less customers you need, typically, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, um, because um, it's, and you need users, but you don't necessarily need paying customers, okay. right? So you need, you need I need to, to, to be able to establish that you're solving a problem for somebody. And if that problem involves, you know, clicking a bunch of times every day, that, that's okay, even if they're not paying you. But, but I, I don't need them to be paying yet. And what about that nacho? I mean, what do you, when, when you're talking to, you know, fledgling um, entrepreneurs, you know, impact, social impact entrepreneurs, you know, what kinds of things, what kind of mistakes are they making? What kind of, you know, how do you help them, help them, you know, turn in the right direction? One of the things we, we always say to the, to the entrepreneurs is to fail fast and cheap. Uh, usually, as, as, as I already mentioned, entrepreneurs fall in love with their ideas and, and they uh, are persistent uh, and, and resilient and they still fail in the, in the same place. Do you think that's more of a risk for impact entrepreneurs because they, they think that there's easy money out there, soft money out there that'll support the, them? Or? The, right now, there is a, 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 a sub, uh, subvention for, for entrepreneurs and, subsidy. and subsidy. a subsidy, subsidy and yeah. entrepreneurs have to use it, but have to use it wisely. But where's Red. that subsidy coming from, specifically in Latin America? Go there are governments, uh, multilaterals, co even companies that are uh, moving from a CSR strategy to a more to an impact investing or trying to align their mission with the social impact. So there, there is a, a lot of free dollars down there. So they, they really have to use it wisely, revisiting the numbers they have. So but let, let's talk about that because you hear that, but then when I talk to you know sort of entrepreneurs, they say, well, that money in theory exists, but you know I had this conversation with an entrepreneur recently that they went to a multilateral who loved their project. They were looking to raise two hundred thousand um, dollars, but they they said that the compliance program, the kind of sort of impact reports that this multilateral was going to require of them was probably going to cost them $200,000 a year to, um, to generate. So is, is it in fact the case that there, that money exists and it's accessible for the it's not easy early to stage entrepreneur? It's not easy to raise $200,000, but it's not impossible and it's easier than, than it used that the years before. So you have to be smart enough to, to, pers to convince these people. And, and if, if, if you portray the other way around, this is not just philanthropy, this is a new way of philanthropy that perhaps can have a return, 
you are uh, turning the conversation the other way around. So I think th there are a lot of opportunities, as, as I mentioned, a uh, lot of uh, social departments of ministries and, and the uh, economy ministers are uh, looking to this kind of projects and, and social entrepreneurs have uh, a great moment, at least in Latin America right now. And let, let's talk about that. If you're, if you're an entrepreneur, you have a product, maybe some uh, customers, people using your product, you know, you're trying to have um, a measure of, of social impact. Um, when you go talk to potential <coughs> investors, people to support this project, do you pitch them the way you pitch a regular traditional project? Um, or, you know, when do you introduce the sort of social impact? Do you start off the conversation by saying, you know, our company is X and it is a double bottom line venture or an impact or, or I mean, what's your uh, sense? I, what's so successful? I, I, I'm looking around because yeah. I think I, here's I mean, the real problem. So I spent, before I came to NIDA, I spent 10 years in traditional investing, right? And the real, the, one of the most frustrating things about philanthropy is you've talked, if you've talked to one social investor, you've talked to one social investor. Right? Like it's really, really hard to generalize about, about um, how to pitch uh, 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 somebody who has this lens. Um, we have people it, around the it, world you know, hoping you'll answer yeah, this right, question. Exactly. On the so, so unfortunately, <laughs> the, the answer is it depends. Right? You really have to know the, the investor. You, have to, you, know, you need to do your, your research before you talk to them. And you need to integrate it in a way not only that you know, talks about the, um, the impact that you have as you've envisioned it, but ideally uses the same language that they um, use to define the impact that they're looking for. And that is such a pain in the ass, honestly. Um, <laughs> it really, because it, it doesn't, um, you know, part of the, one of the big, um, uh, you know, obstacles that philanthropy has to fund, even just, you know, co-funding deals together, is that we can't agree on what it is that, you know, that, what impact means, right? And so, so that's, that's a problem for us, and it's a problem for all of you as entrepreneurs. Um, and so if you have a good idea about how to address that, please let me know. But unfortunately, the, the, you know, the short answer to your question is, is hard work. You, you need to kind of do the work up front to understand what the investor is looking for and try to plug into that. I mean, do you agree that you Completely agree. It's completely case by case. Every pitch has to be different. And it's even worse because if you go to their website and try to figure out what they're talking about, they're not always honest about where they are. Uh, about um, what they're willing to invest in. About what they're willing in. to invest in and what they're not. They use all the same language, and then they don't, it's not until you actually talk to them that you understand what their risk return profile really is, what really excites them, what promises they've really made to their own LPs, um, and the box that they feel like they can play in, which is different for everybody. Don't worry, Joss. We're going to ask you what, what somebody, what it takes to get a few dollars out of, uh, out from you guys. I, I, I think, you know, just to flip that over, we go through the same thing, right? When we're trying to raise money and we're trying to get in front of investors, you know, I think the best thing to do is really, really know the person that you're going to present to and understand what it is that moves them. You know, when you, when you think of social impact, you know, there's about 10 or 20 or, you know, different areas of, of things that you can provide impact in housing, education, um, you know, women's movements, whatever is it is that moves you, you need to research that person that you're gonna present to and know what that person is involved in. If that person is involved in different organizations, read what those organizations are. That will tell you what it is that they're gonna be looking for. Um, and, and I would say start by that. And, and you know, if there's different funds, there are different funds actually that focus on different things. Um, so if you're in a certain sector or in a certain area that you know, number one, they might have a specialty in, or number two, it's something that they have the dollars that are coming in just for that specific purpose, whether it's housing. Microfinance is the perfect example of that. Why was microfinance such a boom in this space? Number one, there was an IPO, so therefore you have you know, a risk metrics that you can attach to it. But number two, you had regular banks that were opening up, you know, microfinance divisions. So that in itself, and it was all for the purpose of bottom of the pyramid. Very defined, very straightforward. It was very easy to, to grow and expand. That's exactly what needs to happen across all of the other spaces and all of the other ideas. And what, what do you tell uh, yeah. your entrepreneurs? Who are I, out raising money. I, I just wanted to, to add one, one comment, um, is that um, business plans always look great. 
and 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 business plans always say that in one year you are going to reach and I don't know how how much money etc. So you really have to not only to think in the in the project but also in the entrepreneur and that's one of the keys of, of successful uh, uh, enterprises that you don't only invest in the in the in the idea but also in the entrepreneur and sometimes this and this uh, enterprise or this project is just part of the school you are uh, investing uh, to 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 improve the career of this of, the, of this entrepreneur and regarding to raise money i i i i agree with with what jocelyn was saying that uh, you really have to know who you are talking to and and really know about the, pro the, the projects you are, you are offering. Yeah, so, I mean, to, I, you guys also write checks when you support companies, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the three of you, is it, do, are you, when you're analyzing a presentation, is the social impact sort of front and center, or is it something that, you know, you're having the back of your head, but you're primarily analyzing the business as a standalone investment, and then, sort of folding in the, the social impact to see if it's sort of a pass-fail, or is that a driver in terms of the uh, investor? I mean, it's, it's, a drive, it's a driver. For us, it's a driver. And again, we have these two separate uh, investment vehicles, one which measures or, or weights um, potential return and social impact equally, and one which really um, gives primacy to social impact and, and worries less about um, uh, the, the economic return, although in both cases, you got to make sure, I mean, the thing doesn't... Do you have separate cards for we each? Have, we have separate, <laughs> yeah, well, they come from different sides of our balance sheet, right? So the okay. way foundations work is we have this big pile of money, basically, $2 billion in Knight's case, um, that we invest in traditional um, financial uh, assets, and that the income we make off that allows us to power our charitable activities, right? And so, so we fund um, the, what we call program-related investments off of our charitable balance sheet, and we fund the kind of more market-rate stuff off of our, our big pile of money. Um, but the... the um, the, I, sorry, now I forgot. The, the, the question was, was what, how, do we, how do we weight those in any conversation? And, and I think the bottom line for us is, unless the business works, you're never going to get the impact you want, right? That's, that's kind of it. And so it goes a little bit back to what you were saying in terms of, of some businesses, you know, the mission is really embedded in, in the business. And generally, that means it's highly, highly scalable, right? So if you, every time you sell a solar panel, you're getting the impact. That means you know you just keep growing the business um, as fast as you want, and you're just generating more impact. If there's a divergence where every time you you know you buy a pair of shoes, you, you sell a pair of shoes, you got to buy another pair of shoes and send it to Africa. You know that's that's much less scalable, generally speaking. Although Tom's, Tom's proves it, but Tom's proves that you can do it. But but from a, you know if you're looking at that, you have to manage it differently. yeah, you have to manage it differently, and it's just it's just a, a whole different structure, right? And so so um, so we're you know we it, 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 I guess the short answer is we don't have. There's no magic um, um, way we look at it, but we, we do evaluate um, both um, really sincerely. Unless you can talk, you know, you can make a strong case for both. Even when when our main goal is is social impact, um, you know, it's really hard for us to invest. So, what, what about? I, I think you know, short, quick answer. Does the product or service solve an issue? And you know, is it is it in some way or form, shape or form focusing on one of the issues that we as a fund are focused in, um, whether that's education, whether that's employment or, or women's issues. Those are the three that we as, as a fund focus on. Um, that's the first question. We don't even get into financials if that's not even part of the of, So for of you it's business. a threshold question I, you before know, you continue the conversation. It is because, you know, you could have a fantastic company that you know, at the end of the day is not addressing any of the three social issues that we care about. And, you know, it could be a fantastic company and, you know, let Carlisle, let, you know, Advin, let those guys pick those companies up. I mean, and, and there is a space out there for each of those of the companies. Um, but we are going to, you know, track this, this space and we're going to find the ones that do both. And what about for you guys? We analyze a lot the, the, the impact the, in terms of social, the, if, if the, the solution they are offering is really uh, directly linked to the, to the problem. We also analyze a lot the, how disruptive the idea is. And the, the third thing we analyze a lot is the entrepreneur, because we fund very early stage projects. So we really know that the, the project is going to change a lot. Uh, so the business model is, is always more flexible. But if you have an entrepreneur that is not uh, good, you have to find another one who is going to partner with him or 
to, to solve this problem. Yeah. And, and is this, Catherine, is this fairly typical as in terms of when you look at? I think it's very typical. I think most of the philanthropic sources um, are mission first. You happen to have two pots, right? But most people are doing it as PRIs. Um, very few have significant, sophisticated um, mission-related investment, which is the corpus he was talking about. Um, and there, the, the screen has to be financial. Legally, it has to be financial along with social. Because it's, because it's part yeah. of their Because mission. it's part of their, it's because, it's because it's part of their corpus and they can be accused of jeopardizing the corpus if they're not paying attention to financial uh, factors. Most for-profit firms are what exactly the word that you used, I think of it as a kind of threshold for impact. There's a certain threshold, you meet it, then we talk about everything else. Okay. And, and in terms of, um, for the entrepreneurs in the room, um, I think, you know, a lot of them know where to find, you know, the active investors, um, you know, traditional investors, um, particularly, say, in Latin America. Um, you know, there's Vox Capital and, and uh, various other, you know, sort of funds in Latin America who are active in the impact space. But I think a lot of times, you know, maybe they're doing fewer investments or, you know, they have slightly less capital. Um, how, how do the entrepreneurs in the room, you know, sort of find out who's active, where those, you know, where, so who's active in terms of investors, and then similarly where some of those soft dollars might be from corporates or multinationals? I don't know. Do you guys have any specific? I, I think you, sh you need to go, you know, first you need to start with your desk research and look, pe look at people's portfolios, exactly what she was saying before. What are people excited by? How can you get to know some of those communities? And then what are the places where investors are congregating? Um, and looking at entrepreneurs, and can you get yourselves, you know, in that mix? It's a, it's a, it's a high touch uh, endeavor to to raise capital. Uh, so you have to put. Do you yourself think it's higher touch for the, for raising capital for no. these kinds of ventures? No. no, I think it's just the same. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 would agree. I mean, I think you know any investment relationship. If it's you're just talking to an individual, even if they're super geared at you know quick turnarounds, early stage investment, it takes you know eight or nine touches before you know before. That individual, whether they sit in an institution like mine, or they're just somebody who, you know, an individual who invests, um, to to really commit um, to a person they've never met before. And so, so the first place to look is friends and family, because you've already gone through those eight and nine touches, right? Like, right. And, and if you can't convince <laughs> you, you, if you can't, if you can't convince your friends and family, honestly, to put in a little money, even if there's, you know, a little bit less return involved, you have a problem. You have a serious problem. You should really think about that. Um, uh, the second place to look at is is crowdfunding, honestly, because. It solves two problems. One is it proves that people care about the issue that you're caring about, and you, you actually get a gauge of how much people care about it based on what they're willing to contribute. And you also build a market, you know, for for the product up front. And you know, you can use platforms like Udemy. Thank you. You can, you can pay me plug. later for that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, um, or you know, if you're based in the U.S., you, there are a bunch, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, the the, uh, the so so I would look at both of those things um, before. Um, I, I looked at the big institutions because the big institutions are a little bit tougher to crack. And if you've gotten the traction that you need at the, you know, kind of easier to access funds, then it helps you um, in terms of approaching the bigger funders. So, yeah, I mean, have you, do you guys have any? I mean, pretty much the same. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think there are a lot of impact investors, but I prefer to go to the traditional venture capitalists and convince them that they are going to be happier and still rich if they invest in social causes. Okay, so so you go talk to the 500 startups of the world, yeah, um, et cetera. So anyway, we're going to move to um, some some Q and A. I mean, I'm I'm actually um, Nancy Nancy likes me to moderate because I always promise only one thing, which is I'm going to finish on time. So we'll take about 15 minutes of of Q and A, and then actually similar as we did last year. Um, I always find it interesting in the room. I know there's you know a number of people here. Um, uh, like from Ashoka, from Endeavor, and some other in institutions that are sort of in this space generally, and I, you know, going to allow five or six people to give, you know, not more than 30-second um, plugs in terms of what their institutions are doing um, in the space. So we'll do that at the very end. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for um, some questions. So I saw a hand up here. Hi, great discussion, by the way, and I think it would be helpful, it's a general question for, for the panel, what qualifies an enterprise as an impact enterprise as opposed to a more traditional for-profit for enterprise that has a sustainability and social uh, responsibility strategy? 
Everyone's pointing Catherine, don't at, feel <laughs> on the spot. Yeah, right. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's pointing at me because it's kind of these when you know it when you see it questions, uh, right? There's a little bit of the entrepreneur saying, I care about this and this is important to me and I'm going to build it in. And there's a little bit of other people agreeing that it is um, in some way doing that. I, I, I mean, the, the, the certification is trying to combat the subjectivity of that, right? Where people are saying, I have committed to certain practices. They are measurable. They are verifiable. And you can trust me that I'm actually doing this. The certification is a shortcut to say, stay this is an impact enterprise. Other than that, it's a judgment That's call. A judgment I don't know call. how else, to, know answer how else to answer it. <coughs> Felipe, Felipe. Hello, thank you <clears throat> very much for the discussion. My name is Felipe Arango from BSD Consulting and Triplus. I just wanted to, to get your impressions on, on, on two issues. The, the first one is in, in building the space in Latin America for impact investment on the importance of creativity in terms of looking at deals differently, structuring deals differently in terms of <coughs> layers of perhaps uh, philanthropic capital. different I think types there's of a, capital. I think there's a spectrum, right? And I complete, I love your question because I actually think we need more of that, right? As, as philanthropic and government dollars get into this space, they bring um, the, the ability to unlock traditional fund models and to try new things. Um, and so I think there's a ton of that going on. But do you At see same, that innovation? Do I you actually see people see tons trying? Of it. Tons I see of tons it? of it. But you don't see it from the outside because even the fund managers who are innovating that way wrap themselves in mainstream language and say, we're, we're like everybody else because that's kind of what they feel like they need to tell their LPs. But I can, when you I can deeper, speak to that a little bit, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe she disagrees. Um, I, it's actually one of the things that I love about this space, believe it or not, because I think there is an enormous you know, opportunity to be innovative. Innovation can be a huge component, and it's what can make the space grow. And what that means is you can either create a financial product that is understandable to that LP space. <coughs> so going back to my derivatives comment in the beginning, you know, how did derivatives get to grow so fast? Because you took the unknown and you made it known, and therefore people understood the language and understood what they were investing in. And that is sort of the opportunity here. Um, you're going into a space that is unknown. You know, what they say in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. That's sort of the, the concept. We're being the one-eyed person that, are, that is going into the space, trying to create a product, and hopefully there will be many other managers that will come in with their specialty coming in, whether it's on the fixed income side, whether it's on the currency side. You know, how you structure the transaction is going to be key because that means that you'll open up the space to other types of investors and you'll get more dollars that will be available coming into the space. And you won't just be talking about philanthropy dollars. You won't just be talking about, you know, people that are willing to take less for their investment. You'll actually be talking about endowments and pension funds that can come into the space. Well, let's talk about that because the second part of the question really spoke to exits, which I, as a moderator, <laughs> failed miserably by not uh, bringing that up. So thanks a lot, Felipe, for, uh, for, for helping us out there. I mean, what, what, how important in terms of analyzing whether to make these kinds of investments is a clear exit? I mean, you hear in traditional VC that, you know, without a very, you know, sort of clear path, um, to an exit, you know, most funds have a seven-year life. Um, they have to have an exit generally. You know, they have even the right to redeem their shares after five years. This is not, by definition, patient capital. Is that... Um, um, I, I think, well, let me, ju let's just step back a little bit to, you know, 10 or 15 years ago in LATAM, in the capital market space. If you added all of the GDPs, 
you know, of every country, Mexico, Brazil, and all of the others. There was about 40% of that combined GDP that was traded on the exchanges. Today, that's about 60%. So what that basically means versus, you know, 112, 115% of the U.S., which is, it's a levered um, economy. What that basically means is that you still have got another 40% of that GDP that's in private hands. It's private companies, you know, they're either in growth capital stage, um, and that is an opportunity, which could be an exit strategy, to take those companies into that public arena. Compartamos is, was only one example, but there could be other companies that could be taken onto that space. And as the capital markets arena matures, and it certainly is, you know, it's much better than it was 15 years ago, that is now opening itself up as a possible exit. And what, what about that, Ben? Uh, Nacho, I mean, how important do you think is the exit story well, relative to, you know, the impact story relative to the return story? I, I mean, our perspective is a little bit different. I think ultimately, um, Ultimately, you want exits, right? Because that's what's going to bring the, the, big, um, the big capital to the space. I think in Latin America, if you, you know, even outside of the, the impact space, uh, um, you know, there, there's a lack of exits on the venture side. And so that's, that's certainly not helping um, in terms of driving uh, more investment to, to impact or generally to venture uh, funding. But, um, but you know, the, the, what you were talking about in terms of creativity, I mean, you know, some impact uh, uh, businesses just have a much steadier stream of revenues, right? Because they can't, you know, they don't need, they, they can't raise $100 million to begin with. They build their businesses much more incrementally. And so that creates, I mean, you know, if you look at low-income housing or, or, you know, even, um, you know, some small businesses, it, it creates a much smoother stream of income. And so what you can find in, in philanthropic, the, the advantage of, of impact investing is that they don't necessarily have these five to seven year time horizons, or at least from, you know, if you get money directly from the foundation, we don't have you know, that five to seven year time horizon, we could make an investment where, where the, the time horizon is a little bit more undefined because we, we value that. Um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is for, for, you know, the select group of philanthropic funders like us, you know, exits aren't that important, but if you really want, you know, if you want the universe to broaden, you, those exits have to start coming. I don't, I don't know, yeah. I just wanted to add a comment regarding to creativity. Um, innovation is right now a hot topic and everyone talks about innovation. I, and I was talking with uh, another scholar a couple of weeks ago and he told me innovation is like sex at the age of 13. Everyone talks about it, but no one has done it. <laughs> so sometimes I have the feeling that, that we just have to, to do new things. And, and if you think about the internet, for example, uh, only two billion people are connected to the internet right now. And uh, by 2020, it is estimated that we are going to have five billion people. So uh, for the first time ever, uh, we, we can uh, find new ways of, for example, delivering education or water, sanitation or job creation. And we are still trying to uh, create the iPhone 6. And entrepreneurs have their, uh, as their role model, Mark Zuckerberg or Instagram. And, and, and they don't realize that the iPhone 6, uh, two thirds of the world don't have where to plug it in. So the innovations have to be uh, really focused in the places that are needed more. And, uh, and creativity is, is the key for it. Innovation is the key for it. Great. Uh, another question? Hi, I'm Laura Maidon. I need to stand up. Um, a lot has been said of how entrepreneurs can certify that they're, you know, or prove that they have a, a, a social impact. But I'm curious to hear your perspectives as fund managers. I mean, because I think it's a very thin line and you can almost always justify that investing in something creates wealth and jobs and generates a social impact. And I think Compartamos is a great example because, you know, uh, there was a lot of debate when it, it, it IPO'd. And I'm on the social impact for profit side, but, you know, um, not everyone thinks the same. So I'm curious to think, to, to hear how you you make sure you, you stay true to your social impact investments. Um, I think it all, you know, you got to go back and look at the team that makes the fund. Um, I think one of the best learning experiences I've had was when one of my, our operating partners, um, you know, he's probably watching right now if, if he's watching. Um, Just wave. You know, yeah, I could wave. He's in Colombia. And, you know, 40 years experience in, in the mining industry, 
mining industry, right? Which is sometimes considered, you know, the other extreme. And, you know, ran companies in, in, in the 80s, in the 90s, and one of the best reasons, the best conversations I had with him was, you know, he said to me, when I was running the mine, when I was running my business, back in the 80s and the 90s, I wish I had a fund that, that was investing in us that could tell me all of these social impact ways because we would have less riots, we would have less problems, we would actually have more conversations with the government and probably the company would have been a lot <coughs> more profitable and would have been, you know, had a longer run if back then CEOs of companies were embracing that. Um, and this is, in, you know, a partner that we have in our group. And, and so that, you know, to circle back to your question, that's what you need to look at. What is the, the mind and the thought process of the people that are part of the team? And how do they interpret impact? And wh what are they seeing as, you know, could be impactful? You could look at a regular business model, and you're right. And you can say, okay, this business has, you add a, you know, corporate social responsibility arm, there you go, it check the box. Um, but you have to look at the managers and see why are they into it. You know, what, what, what makes them motivated? Um, uh, I just, uh, I mean, we take the money back. So that, that's how we insure. I mean, you know, if, um, if, 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 if the, uh, if they, if, you know, for, particularly for program related investments, right? So if we're, if we're using charitable dollars to fund you to do, um, you know, to address a particular social ill, and like you said, you know, business plans change, right? Um, and you, you know, and your business model changes to the point where you're no longer addressing that social ill, we'll take the money back. Um, and so that usually works. <coughs> so, Peter, um, you, you have um, a question. I've got an actual, a question about um, the role of debt. No one's really talked. I mean, you, Jocelyn, you talked about bonds and derivatives. What, if any, is the role of debt, for example, in Latin America? And uh, our experience, we've been thinking about this for about 10 years, is that um, at Endeavor, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are EBITDA, cash flow positive, not in sexy businesses. You know, they're making window panes or, you know, uh, uh, mattresses, what have you. Uh, and they're scaling because of the growth in these countries, but they're paying factoring costs yeah. to live of, say, 25% per annum. I've gone to them, and I've gone to now entrepreneurs in Turkey, entrepreneurs in Indonesia, because we're kind of spread around the world now. They all have the same problem. So they're profitable, even though they're paying these enormous rates annually. And I've always thought to myself, why not? So the working capital looks like this, right? What if you created a loan facility at 12%? You just cut it in half. I remember going to them and I, some Chilean entrepreneurs, and I said, what about 6%? And they said, hey, gringo, we'd pay 12%. Why, why, why not make more money? And so, you know, what you do if you did that is you'd have an explosion of working capital, and that would literally move the development yep. needle in a big, big way. So how, have you guys been thinking about this all, I, and what's the role of debt? We, we definitely bump into that problem all the time, and I think it's a serious issue in LATAM. But I'll tell you the reason why it got there in the first place. It was because the factorers are the only ones that were lending. And so therefore, that was the only access to capital that these companies have. Actually, the companies that we look at in our space, which is the five to 15 million EBITDA, the growth companies, that is the biggest problem. It's like a, it's like a little dog, it has a lot of fleas in it. You know, it, it's a problem because when you look at the very healthy financial balance sheet, great margins, great product, and you say, how did you get yourself into this? And most of the time, the problem is the conversation with the CEO, because from their perspective, they're saying, well, you know what? These guys gave me money when no one else was around, and it was the only capital that I had access to. A lot of times, it also creates an opportunity for U.S. funds like us that were U.S. GPs, because we can have access to capital a lot cheaper. Um, and we therefore can come in and actually provide that capital, you know, versus that factoring that is coming in at 25%. The issue though, and the risk is the currency. So, you know, even though we're borrowing in dollars, we're lending in the local currency and that can go against you and can eat you up in the, you know, the 12 or 15% that you're charging in two seconds. So, you know, there's risk coming in on both sides. 
it is definitely an issue, but it's also an opportunity, I think, in, in lots of these growth companies. Yeah, what, I mean, do you see innovation in that space in I the do, US? and I think I agree with you. It's a huge um, opportunity. There's actually, you know, there's one impact investing product in the US that is publicly listed, and it's a debt product. It's the Calvert um, investment note. There's another one that was just um, approved by the SEC last week, Trilink Global, which is also a debt product, and there's another one in the works that I'm not supposed to talk about. So I think what you're seeing is people saying, the risk is so low, we can actually register these, register these as securities, open up, up to retail investors, and blast them out of the water. So I completely agree with you. It's the next thing. That's great. I, we're, we're actually out of time, but the good news is the uh, panelists are going to stay for the cocktail party, which we're hosting um, after this event. So you'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, follow up with questions. As I mentioned, um, especially since um, you know, this is about impact investing, and you know, we're really interested in helping promote the, uh, the, the community down here, I wanted to at least give a couple, a few people in the room an opportunity to just discuss uh, their organization and what they're doing in the space. So uh, Peter, and maybe Lorena from Ashoka. Uh, thank you. This is a surprise. I was yeah, not. <laughs> thank you for the surprise. Um, yes, hi, Lorena Garcia from Ashoka. Um, I think the only thing that I would add from our perspective is Perfect. that... Say what Ashoka does and what you're doing in Miami. Oh, cool. Okay, so <laughs> Ashoka does two things. Basically, we invest in social entrepreneurs and we invest in change makers. We're trying to create an ecosystem where everybody can be part of the change and understands that they can, they can add themselves to the social entrepreneur arena. In Miami in particular, we're trying to generate local impact uh, helping youth to understand themselves as change makers. We're also trying to look for new social entrepreneurs and um, we're definitely trying to work in terms of empathy and with universities. Actually Duke is one of our change maker campus um, designations. So in terms of impact investing, um, what we have learned is that social entrepreneurs, um, our social entrepreneurs, because of the due diligence that we do with them, because they have a stamp um, that we um, make sure that they're the most innovative, the highest impact, uh, we can actually provide and help them um, if they're available for or applicable for investment, that they already have this very interesting way of showing the social return. Mm -hmm. So in that case in particular, we're getting in there and also a very positive um, futuristic uh, comment is that a lot of our new social entrepreneurs are coming from a business world. So they're getting um, their MBA people uh, that are creating models to solve social problems. And that, that is really something that we want to see in the next five years. What is that going to happen? And how are we going to see the new generations of social entrepreneurs with business models thanks to those type of um, opportunities? Thank you, JP. Um, this will be the fourth year that we're hosting. We started as a conference. Now, oh, I get to get my picture taken, too. Uh, it's three pictures. Wow, the lab is really uh, booming here with the pictures. Uh, we host both a conference and festival. It's in April. Uh, we've really grown tremendously. We're hosting 200 speakers from over 40 countries. So if you like what you saw today, we're really going to drill deep. And if you're really interested in the space, if you really want to make a commitment to impact, I invite you to check out the website, ConnectionMiami.com. Always mention your website. For the festival side, we have a separate website. It's called Sustainatopia. And the goal is to engage people around Miami uh, because not everyone's going to attend a conference, right? Conferences can be boring, or if you don't do it for a living, it's just not, you know, worth your time. Um, so we do a festival where we're hosting over 50 events over seven days. We have some of our partners here. Felipe is a partner on a global social entrepreneur program that we're doing with 40 global social entrepreneurs from around the world. So please, uh, probably the best thing is to check out the websites, ConnectionMiami.com, Sustainatopia.com. It's a seven-day event from April 16th to April 22nd. We have everything from free events. This is terrific. This is a free event. Uh, to hoity-toity, $100 fundraisers. Uh, we have something at Bill Dean's mansion out in Miami Beach. So uh, take your pick and, and come support Sustainatopia. 
the IMPACT conference and certainly support the lab and groups like Ashoka. Uh, my name is Peter Kellner, and I co-founded Endeavor, actually modeled on Ashoka. I had, a good, well, I had the honor of meeting the founder, Bill Drayden, in uh, March 1990. Uh, we were technically formed in 1996, again, modeled on Ashoka, which looks for what we call high-impact social entrepreneurs. We look for so high-impact business entrepreneurs. Uh, that being said, about 8 to 10 percent of our entrepreneurs do have a social consequence, but we put business first. Uh, and we've actually found through studies, um, if you're going to pursue that path, and you know, pursuing a philanthropic path is great as well, but if you're going to pursue a return path, the, the, the probability of success is much in, <laughs> dramatically higher if you first think about the financial return and how you're going to make money. Um, so Endeavor is now in 16 countries. Uh, we have an affiliate model so that all our countries are affiliates of one another, including the U.S. We go out and essentially hunt for, we like to say, Steve Jobs or Anita Roddick across Latin America, Southeast Asia now, the Arab Middle East, Africa. Um, and uh, last year we had about five, our entrepreneurs generated about 5.6 billion in revenue, uh, up to now about 200,000 jobs that pay 10 times the average national wage in the countries in which we operate. Uh, by 2020 we'll be, um, well by 2015 we'll be in 25 countries and by 2020 will be generating about 20 billion annually in millions of jobs. Um, this is more than 30 seconds, so I'll just finish with, uh, I moved down here about a year and a quarter ago, uh, looked around and said, you know, there's a renaissance taking place here in Miami. The United States really needs innovation, job creation outside of Silicon Valley, Boston, Austin, New York. Oh, and by the way, Endeavor's now going into Europe. So we had launched Greece, we're about to launch Italy, Sp uh, Spain, Portugal, Poland. So I went and pleaded to my board, let's do something in the United States. And so with Juan Pablo and the Knight Foundation, actually the Knight Foundation was the first meeting I had with Matt Hagman, uh, we have now uh, decided to launch Endeavor in Miami as the first U.S. city. We'll take a city approach. Thanks. We're going to take a city approach to the United, to the United States. Miami's the test bed. Um, we are not going to fail because, you know, if they can get it done in Lebanon, we can get it done in, in Miami. Um, so I'll finish with that, except um, a little bit of uh, recruiting. We are now putting our board of directors together. It's the first step that we do. It's an independent board uh, interacting with all our other countries. So we're looking for board members who typically are business people in the community, but also for all of you out there who are entrepreneurs um, and other um, we're looking for a managing director to follow from the completion of our board, which will hopefully be completed sometime in March. So if you have ideas for people, this managing director is going to be absolutely critical to our success. That person will get to travel all around the world, but really be responsible for the um, hopeful success of Endeavor Miami. Thank you. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Peter, and thanks for Endeavor for showing the confidence of coming down here. I'm almost true to my word, I think it's 7.32. So with that, um, I will thank our, our panelists, Catherine, Ben, Jocelyn, and, and Nacho. Nacho will be the president of Uruguay, I'm sure within 10 or 15 years. You should probably speak to him um, and, and, and get your picture taken with him. Um, we're gonna do a, a, a cocktail party. Um, the people here from the Duke, for the Duke Gen event, um, I think most of you have like, blue uh, tags. Um, we're going to walk over to about 810 to the Winwood Kitchen, which is two blocks away. So we should, you know, meet near the, uh, the front of the space at a, just after 8. So with that, um, thanks again. Thank you very much, Nancy and the council, for um, having faith in us, and hopefully we lived up to it. Thank you.